And recording. Hello, everyone. Uh, all right. Ready to kick this thing off? Uh, yes. All right. Starting in three. Oh, excuse me. Starting in three, two, one. Welcome back to another spoiler cast. I'm your host, Boston. And joining me is Moonpeer. Hello. Uh, this time we're going to spoil what remains of Edith Finch. Uh, yes. I think I previously we talked about Doki Doki Literature Club, which was a a uh, a surprise game. I would say, and I think mm -hmm. what remains of Edith Finch was another surprise game for me, where I was sort of like, "Yeah, everyone seems to really like this this year, so let's give it a shot." Oh, it's actually really good. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, boy, where to start? I I think the I think this game starts on a really high note i think it's cool how it makes you open that book at the beginning to sort of teach you the controls yep and i really like when you're walking down that path from the first time it shows up until the last time it shows up putting the subtitles in the environment never once got old nope never once and it was it they didn't reuse the subtitles that much at all Right, and it actually makes me laugh because my wife is hard of hearing, and I always have subtitles on, and so so does she. Yeah, and literally the first thing we always do in every game we play is go into the options and look for subtitles. Yep, this game doesn't have a subtitles option. Oh yeah, that's right, it doesn't. Because I do the same thing. Like I, I just need to have subtitles on because I. Uh, uh, I that's I your like anime it. fan showing. <laughs> yeah, <that> maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, I just sort of like it in general, and I was a little disappointed. I'm like, oh, I didn't aren't really any options for this game at all well we'll just start it and it was like oh that's, that's super like, cool <laughs> yeah um and yet yeah, start as he either says it starts you start at the house which yep. i loves my i love my wife's description of this it's like the weasley house that's the first thing i thought i thought when you walk up to the house and it's just like jutting off and you can tell people just put room after room stacked on top of each other at the top of the house and just like yep all right, this is this is definitely something I haven't seen before in a game where it's just this the the house itself has a lot of character too. Yeah, it really does. And the build up as well as you're walking through the forest and you're getting the subtitle reveal and the way it breaks them against the trees. Yeah. And things like that like the presentation just from the get go. Like it's not a super realistic art style. It's kind of cartoony but it's really well done yeah and just the presentation from well from step number one or seat number one when you're sitting on the boat right. is really nicely done yeah and i like i there's two things i really like about this game one is i guess there's three uh one is i really like the presentation of the subtitles you know when you're walking through the forest at the beginning and the subtitles are on the gate and you open it up and they sort of swing away too Mm -hmm. I really, really loved in this game how everything for so I'm playing it on PS4, so it's either R1 or R2 to interact with stuff. You have to hit R1 to like grab onto something, and then like if you're opening a door, you have to push it forward. You know, you push the stick forward to, or you're opening up a hatch, and you have to like push it, you know, push the stick forward to lift it up, and it all felt good and Natural. It felt. Yeah, it felt natural, and it felt it would to me. I think that's how a game like Edith Finch breaks out of the quote-unquote walking simulator stereotype, is that you have something to interact with while you're going through the house. It's not just like go up to this door, hit X, I open the door, oh, I'm in the room. You know, you're you're manipulating the environment, and I I think that works so well in the house, and then in each one of these stories, really, really well. Yeah. Um, so I'm. Let's start breaking down some of these stories. I think because it's. Yeah, the, I mean it's it, the the way it's described is is it's thirteen. I think it describes it as thirteen stories. It neglects to mention it's all the stories of one family. Yeah, it's all about the Finch, the curse of the Finches. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's all. You know, why are you the last living Finch? Uh, yeah, and how did how how did we get to this point where 
Um, you're investigating the house just to figure out what happened to your own family. Yeah, and my favorite thing it does is it drops lines that you will immediately think, wait, what? And then it answers them later, like when you are approaching the house. Um, I believe Edith Finch says um, that her senior Edie has lived in the house since the original house sank. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sort of like, well, the house did what? <laughs> what? Did ha the house sank? Uh -huh. Yeah, like how does... And it, it feels good because it, it really feels like... It really feels like there's this mystery, not only to the Finches and what what happened with their history, but also what happened to this house. The house is a character by itself, and I think that's yeah. I think that's so cool. Um, yeah, it's, especially when you actually like depend on your method of getting in. I think I went the doggy door route. I don't know if you have I did to. Too, yeah. Um, but when you get there. And you go inside and you start exploring, and it looks like it looks like a lived-in house. Mm -hmm. Like you get the personality from every room, every main room, I should say, before we go into the bedrooms. But like the kitchen, everything, and the commentary that they throw in helps a lot. Like when you're walking through the kitchen, and she says, "We all got fed up of salmon once <laughs> yeah. someone started working up at the cannery, except yeah. for the cat. The cat still loved it." Yeah. And, you're walking around and it's like, oh, why can I not get into any of these doors? Oh, wait, that's because they're all sealed shut. Yeah, and I, I, th I think that's so great. And I think the the um, the when you find out what the key is for, and you go up to that book and you open it, and then behind it is like the opening to another room. Yep. At that moment, I was like, "Okay, this this game is really, really pretty cool." Apologies if everyone here hears a stupid dog in the background. Let me close this window. Um, my favorite use of the key, I have to say right now, is the bathroom um, book because she uses the same key two or three times to unlock yep. a couple of the books, and the bathroom book is my favorite one because it's there is a secret inside this bathroom, and then you unlock the book and then you open it and it's a, it's like a kid's cartoon book yeah it's like a pop-up book and on the inside it says it's in this book yeah it's like it's not and in the toilet it's not in the shower it's in this book and you like pull it out yep yeah I, so i the very first um uh story you delve into is the one of molly finch and i think this is the one thing that they showed off really early was the the shark rolling down the hillside Yes. And everyone was like, was this like a shark Katamari game? Like, what the <laughs> hell is this thing? And I think this is such a cool explanation of like a child's imagination where you're mm -hmm. a cat and then you're uh, an owl and then you're the, uh, the shark and then you're the monster and then the monster eats Molly. Um, you know, it's it's such a cool thing where you instinctively that's one of the great things about this game is you instinctively know the controls like mm. when you're an owl of course hitting the button is going to make you swoop so you can catch a rabbit yep. you know the word rabbit is circling around the rabbit on the ground yeah um, um do you know how molly died no because i missed this and my wife cleverly caught it really well okay um the reason Molly is hung Molly the Molly's story starts with her saying she got sent to bed without any dinner. Yep. So she was hungry, so she wanted something to eat. So she ate the toothpaste. Right. And she, she ate, ate a bunch of berries. other stuff. And she ate holly berries right. from the windowsill, which are very highly toxic. Right. So my wife said, said to me, and I didn't notice it when she said it, she said, Molly died of poisoning, didn't she? Like she <laughs> yeah. went into hallucination because she had holly berries from the window. Yeah, and that's a very good point that I actually clean missed myself. Yeah, I, I had noticed she'd eaten the berries, but I I didn't put two and two together on that because it was just it's such a strange sequence of events, and I think mm -hmm. that also does help explain that though because if she's poisoned and she's hallucinating, it makes right. perfect sense why all of a sudden she's a cat and then she's a bird. Yeah, and I I think. I think it's a really interesting story, and I think it's a really interesting um, 
introduction to the curse of the finches because they say it's a curse but i i think was as we continue to play through the game it's not really a curse it's just kind of bad luck or just it's bad, bad luck, decisions I mean, life is life is hard it's a yeah. mixture of life is hard and bad luck kind of thing life like the hit this family is... tree pretty hard mm-hmm yeah um uh, who do we have here next um let's pull up the family tree here we have I'm, tr I'm trying to walk through it here on in order and i'm trying to look at some walkthroughs and a lot of them are um these like achievement walkthroughs it's like well i don't i don't want that i just want to know in order who we yes. ran into i think the next one is kevin kelvin calvin uh this is the um the swing the swing one which moon and i both ran into the same thing where it's like i'm just sort of i'm kicking the one leg the one that isn't broken and i'm like listing over to the left side oh i need to use both legs yep and uh, my wife figured that one out because she just sat there not swinging and just doing little kicks with her legs oh like sending them back and forth oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's really good but that that sequence i love because it gives the, people talk more in modern racing games about a sensation of speed yeah and how a lot of them don't do a good enough job the prime example of this is burnout paradise when you go on 100 miles an hour you feel that way you feel like you're going 100 mile an hour on this swing yeah like the wind rushing past your face the i think it does a slight camera trick where it like tightens the view the view a little bit i think so to make yeah. it look like it's further away than it is and all you're hearing all the time is rush as the wind just is coming past your face it's really well done yeah, and I, I like, I really like how they presented a lot of these stories where it's this almost like bittersweet romantic, like, yeah, this kid died, but he also, like, for the first time figured out how to fly. And mm -hmm. it's, there's something, the, the word I use to, to describe this game so often is bittersweet, because it's really like a sort of a sweet story that ends up in a kid dying. You know, yeah. but it's it's told so strongly, and, and the woman who does the voice acting for Edith is, is so strong. She sounds the perfect age. She has the perfect hesitancy when she's talking. And I think this mm -hmm. is one of those stories where it's sort of like, oh man, that was really good and super well, sad. Specifically in the in the kids stories, like whenever we get one of these stories that involves younger people, I think it does a really great job of expressing the innocence of child of yeah. children. Like, yep. he doesn't know he's going to plummet to his death after he jumps off the swing over the fence. Yeah, he just wants to he... go all the way around. Every kid does. Mm -hmm. It took me so long to figure out what they meant when they said that. Like the... Oh, yeah. She t Edith is talking about the older brother saying he should never have said to him, it's impossible to go all the way around because right. he wants to do everything that you say is impossible. Yep. And I was thinking, what's he talking Oh, I'm on a swing all the way around the swing. Now <laughs> I get it. Right. Every kid's dream. Yes. Uh, the next one, um, which I really liked, and a lot of the stuff in between isn't super interesting until we get to the later part of the game. I um, do love how, though, when before you do in the individual stories, when you go, as you're progressing through the bedrooms of this house, yeah, as you're doing that, the rooms are so individual. Yeah. Like, they represent those characters so well, especially after you've done the story and you just take a look around. It's like, okay, yeah. I could see this being that person's room. Yeah, exactly. Um, the next one is probably one of my favorites in the game, and that's Barbara, the Scream Queen. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I, I liked hers, but I think hers is outshone later and later. Oh, for sure, yeah. I, I don't think hers is the best. Um, that that is, that is the best one later. Um, mm -hmm. I, what I really liked about hers is the it the comic is represented like tales from the crypt really well like it yeah it nails the voice that. acting is so good yeah and like the style and all that and i what i wasn't expecting is i was expecting to just kind of turn through this book and have it be a story but when you start controlling some of the panels and the the art style in the game that you're controlling is the art style of the comic yep. i was like all right man like you, you're really getting me here. This is really good. It's really well done. It's like, oh, here's a. Then she crept downstairs, and it's like, okay, nothing's happening. 
It was like, Wiggle the oh, stick. Fuck. Wait, wait, wait. I have to, I'm controlling it inside of the panel, inside of the game. It's yeah. inceptioning me in a video game. I'm playing a game within a game within a game. Yeah. It's uh, so well done, and it's so well presented. Like, the voice acting, the, the art style change, that section, it, it, that was when I thought this might be something special. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, this is... You have presented me three different stories at this point that have all been completely different and controlled completely differently, mm -hmm. and I really love it. <laughs> yep. Uh, the next one is Walter. Uh, this was the one that I I thought wasn't going to be super great. This is the guy who went under the house and was hidden for 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the progression of time, you know, with him opening a can of peaches, and it's 10 years later, it's 20 years later. Um, this for me is probably one of the least interesting stories up until the very ending, because it very much is like, something is outside, shaking the whole house, and I don't know what it is, but I'm not leaving. And then once it stops, he decides to leave, and as soon as he, like, tastes the sea air, he gets hit by a train. Yep. <laughs> and it's sort of like, you know what? Yeah. That's that's the Finch curse, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. I can't remember why he decided to go and live in the basement. Um, yeah, it is it is brought up and it is mentioned, but it it's less interesting than the fact that there's a man living under the house yeah. who just happens to be their uncle, who they all say has gone missing slash dead. Yeah, yeah. There was some point. I feel like there was some strife uh, in the family. I think it was what happened to Barbara is what caused him to vanish. Oh, yeah, because he said, oh, I'm going to go look for her and then disappear in the basement. Yeah, because Barbara was murdered, which is how she died. Right. Uh, she was murdered by fans because she was a former actor. Right. And what happened to her is what caused him to decide, no, I think I'm done. Yeah. Uh, the next one is, is probably my least favorite because it's the most frustrating, and that is Sam. Uh, the one where Sam and... The photograph. Yeah, the, the photograph one, which is such a cool idea. And I feel like I, for two or three of the photographs, I spent way too long zooming in and zooming out and panning all over the place and just not finding it and figuring... Trying to figure out what to photograph. Yeah, I have to like zoom all the way out to pan over to where I couldn't before. It, it was pretty frustrating, but man, that had a great payoff of I didn't want to shoot this deer you're gonna take a picture next to it now wait it's still twitching boop kicked you off a cliff yep <laughs> and just really like that picture where he's yeah, falling the... off the cliff is sort of like yeah man that's a, that's the finches <laughs> yeah i love the fact that his story as well is told in the final print reel of film that was developed by him as well yeah a war photographer who was being killed by a deer and it was literally his last ever photos <laughs> it's a cool touch Mm -hmm. I really liked that. Um, the next one is the the super bummer one, and that's Gregory. Oh, this is yeah. the 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 uh, it, this is the this is the story where I realized that some of these tales, like Maggie's, like Gregory's, are or Molly, sorry, Molly and Gregory, they're not the truth. No, you know, like Gregory turns into a frog and swims away under the water but what really happened is his mom got distracted and he drowned because he's yeah. an infant but like the romanticism around what really happened versus the finch curse was, yeah. is it, pretty it, interesting it's also like you hear that you, you start this story by reading basically divorce papers between his parents yeah and it's the dad talking about like how this kid wouldn't stop laughing, wouldn't stop smiling. Yeah, he was always looking at something, but we never knew what he was. Yeah, he just had such a great imagination. And then the sequence you do with him is it's the quintessential, you know, child's imagination. My toys the sequence are alive. Where the toys are alive, there's yep. music, it's like a carnival show going on. Yeah. It was so well done. Yeah, I. Yeah, it it's a really hard one to watch because you know what's happening, mm -hmm. but I think the, the, you know, just like Sam's one or, or Calvin's, sorry, just like Calvin's, where it's sort of like, 
that's a real romantic way of saying a kid died. I, mm-hmm. I think there's a real romantic one saying, like, well, he turned into a frog and he went down the drain and now he's out at sea living with his frog friends. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty great, but um, that that's one of the tougher ones to watch. Yeah. That one, when I think with that one, when I figured out that he wasn't exactly, he didn't grow up. I was thinking, oh no, oh, I don't really want to play this sequence if I'm completely honest. Yeah, like that's the one where it's like, he died real young. This is mm-hmm. this is real rough. Um, the next one is one of my more favorite ones in the game, and that's Gus, the yes. one with the the kite, the kite. at the wedding. Um, yep. Just a really cool idea of unveiling and unscrambling the letters and like scraping the letters off of the side of a cliff and you know attacking stuff in the environment um yeah this is where the subtitles interaction comes in a lot yeah where it, it, it stops telling the story and then you're flying this kite around and you see oh wait what's all this white lettering in these trees fluff, 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 and continue the story yeah i i think the bad part about gus's story is it's one of the one of the least likely ones to sort of believe. Um, you know, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time and got smushed by a a tent. Um, you know that that's that one is the probably the most mundane out of all the the Finch demises. It is as well, but at the same time, like you, I don't know how much exploring you did, but it's actually in the family tree picture. If you look at him, the kid has got a mohawk. Uh, well, oh, I he only, does, yeah. Which means he's what? Maybe he's thirteen when he gets when he dies. Yeah. And he's right at that stage where young thirteen-year-old boy mohawk. He's very rebellious kind of thing. Devil may care. Yeah, I could kind of see it being a little bit more like the parents are just fed up, especially considering he says he doesn't need a stepmother because the, yeah. there's a wedding going on and it's his dad being remarried to a different woman. I can understand him acting that way and why yeah. that might be a bit more possible. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the next one is the game's shortest one that I sort of liked a lot, and that's Milton. That's uh, Milton Finch and the Magic Tassel. Yes. Which is really great. You bring up a flip book, and as you're flipping through the flip book, it's Milton drawing another flip book, and he jumps into a, like a portal or a keyhole, a giant keyhole in a doorway, and it disappears, and then the rest of the flip book is blank. Yep. Like, and that same, that's it. <laughs> that same door is actually painted at the bottom of his tower. Yep. Um, but his is the. It, I think it's the, the the shortest of the stories, but also the most interesting because it is very representative of Milton just vanished. Like yeah. he literally just disappeared. They don't know if he's alive. They don't know if he's dead. He's did he just... go through the doorway for mm-hmm. real? You know, like or did he just poof and disappear? I I think that's one of those ones where like I finished the book and I was like, oh, oh, that was really good, huh? Yeah, interesting. Um. I sort of second to last I think it is here is is the best one I, yes. I, I would be surprised if anyone was going to argue and that's Lewis yep. um, it's certainly the longest it's certainly the most uh, complex and it's the most involved and man it's really good because I think mm-hmm. the beginning of it is you reading the psychiatrist or psychologist's note saying like yes this dude is just in his own head and it's, unfolding his it, his imagination. Yeah, it's even worse because it, they talk in that letter about how it's his first period of sobriety. Yeah. Like, he's stopped doing drugs, he's stopped drinking, he's sober for the first time in a long time, and he can't handle it. It's, yeah. It's not because he's got urges to do the drugs or anything like that still. It's the fact that he has such a vivid and active imagination that it looks like that's what the drugs were doing for him, were putting a dampener on it, Mm -hmm. allowing him to just operate semi-normally. Because what happens in this story is both incredible and so horribly depressing at the same time. Yeah, and from a a gameplay and from a it's really interesting having to juggle 
the two things at once. Like you have to continue to do your job, which is cutting the heads off the the salmon. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have to control with the other stick. You have to control the character in this ever expanding. And I think that's my favorite thing. This thing did was you know it starts off as like an ASCII art, like doop 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 doop. You know, just walking through. And the more involved his imagination gets, the larger it becomes on this salmon head chopping table um, until it's just completely overtaken the screen and it's this cool great looking 3D behind the back full experience yeah it goes like from from that to like the isometric perspective and then yeah. it does the the expanded universe with the boats and sailing down a river and like some um, crappy PS1 graphics yes incredible moment when you're going down the river as well and it, it basically gives you a choice are you inter are you looking for a princess or a prince yeah like and I liked how they worded it it was the handsome princess or the beautiful prince yes um, and then it's like what do they love rainbows versus tentacles I believe it was yeah I think it was that um, th I mean that's a hell of a scene and I we talked in Doki Doki Literature Club about how games as a medium can only you can only experience or do things in games that you couldn't do in other stuff mm -hmm. and I think this guy's story is proof positive of using the language of games and how games have evolved plus controlling two things at the same time plus it being this story that encapsulates his entire life, it would be really hard to communicate that in something else. Yeah, I don't think you could develop, like, you, you're introduced to this guy at the start of the sequence, and by the end, you care about him, and yeah. it is the longest sequence in the game, but you put on a five-minute commercial, or a five-minute anything, and you develop an emotional attachment to a character in that, yeah. it ain't happening, whereas with this, it's the way the story is told, the interactions that you do in it, it allows you to actually be that much more effective with storytelling because you are interacting with it and then it's great because as you're going as well you chop the heads of salmons to open doors it's, yeah. it's, it's so great at just portraying this guy's I don't want to say like a descent into madness but more like an ascent into madness like in a, a full escape yeah, like he he's had enough of day to day, and he kind of likes his imagination more than he likes the real world. And I can guarantee you, a lot of people in this uh, alive on the planet today have felt that way a lot. Yeah. yeah, and I I think it's one of the times you know most stories in this game uh, are not narrated by Edith herself, and mm -hmm. I think most of them are good. But I think when you get to Lewis's, I think having the doctor narrate almost clinically how yes. his his escapism has progressed, I think that is that a little bit of a t detachment from what's actually happening is is really really cool. Yeah, and it, it comes as well. It allows you to connect that much easier because this is a person who would know. This is someone he would confide all of this in. Yeah. So they would be the person to tell the story because they know him better than anybody else. Yeah. Uh, really, the only two people we have left here in the family tree are Edie and Dawn, who are the two that uh, Dawn being uh, Edith's mom and Edie being Edith's grandmother, um, who they lived with basically at the end. You know, they were the last three finches. Um, yeah. They don't get an extended sequence like everyone else had because it's Edith, you know, uh, narrating it herself saying that, you know, Dawn had enough, you know, her mom had enough of losing everybody and, and sticking around for it. And they left and Edie died overnight. And then Dawn got sick and never got better. And then yeah, same with her dad. Yeah. Same with her dad. And, um, to wrap out the game, is a surprisingly effective and not cheesy birth sequence, which I'm not sure I have seen before in media. Usually nope. it's sort of like, oh god, here we go. Yeah, yeah, you're getting birthed. All right, cool. Yeah, look who's talking. Prime example of how to do it right. wrong. Yeah. Um, 
it somehow earns it, and I think it's another really great bittersweet moment where Edith lives long enough to give birth to her son and presumably dies in childbirth. Yeah, um, that's not clarified at all, but yeah, it does yeah. sound like that's what happened. And I, I like that Edith wasn't the last Finch, and I like that some of her last lines are like, you know, I wrote this book for me, and I never meant for you to find it. And if you did, I'm not here anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's pretty heartbreaking. But there's that sweet side to the bitter of there's another Finch. Yeah, and I especially like the fact that it loops back around to at the start of the game when you come when you're coming into the island on a boat mm -hmm. and you look down the guy's got a broken hand from something but he's also got a bunch of flowers which presumably he's going to go there take it there and place it on the grave of his mother right which is a really nice little touch yeah because you you find out that you're not really playing as edith the whole time just you're mm -hmm. playing as edith's son reading the journal and sort of trying to unveil this mystery yeah um speaking of amazing touches this game does by the way something i didn't notice um it's a modern day thing first person games you look down you have feet you have yeah. a chest you have arms you have that kind of thing uh ed has a bump edith finch has a very oh. noticeable pregnancy bump that you don't know is pregnancy until she drops two hints about it in the actual as uh, she's telling the story she goes right. through but if I... you look straight down she has a little bit of a bump I never put two and two together on that. I, I, I my wife I looked down while she was playing it and was like, "Oh, look! I've got a body. I've got little feeties, <laughs> and look, I've got. I'm. I'm a little chubby." And I was just turned around and walked away. I was like, mm -mm, "Can't say anything. Can't Don't say it. anything. Not gonna spoil it." Yeah, I think just like DDLC, I'm really glad I played Edith Finch so it could get on my top ten list. Yeah, same. Because this is. This is one of those games where, like, it, you know, I over the last couple of weeks I have railed against the term walking simulator because I think they're just adventure games. Yeah, um, it's and what I they think, have evolved into. Yeah, and, you know, there's still the traditional point-click adventure games. There's still adventure games like Oxenfree, and there are first-person ones like, like this game. And I think I, I would be hard-pressed to believe that someone would play Edith Finch and still be upset at walking simulators. Because I, th yeah. I think it's just such a great game and such a great story for the entire thing that mm -hmm. if it you does, don't love it, it does, I don't know what, man. Yeah, it, it does both so well, but the it's very similar to DDLC in the fact that it breaks your expectations of what these games are supposed to be. Yeah. Oh, this is what you think this game is going to be? Let me just flip that on its head for you. Here's a shark rolling down a hill. Right. And it makes sense. It, yeah. Oddly. It, it makes sense. And then here's these heartfelt stories that you control. I've, pretty much most of them differently. Yeah. And they all have different reasons and different things. And this isn't this isn't your daddy's walking game kind of thing. Yeah, it's like, exactly. This is people have made these games and they've made them well this is the next step for them i think yeah uh anything else to to mention before we we close this one out uh not off the top of my head uh, i love this game this game yeah. it's it's not the best game in the world it might be one of my favorite games in the world uh, ever. i think that's well put yeah because it it does it does a lot of things well. It has a couple of issues. It's not breaking the mold. It's not a redefinition of a genre. But it's so well done. Yeah. It, I don't think it can be considered the best. But it's definitely my favorite. Yeah. I will wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah. Alright, well thank you very much everyone for watching and listening to yet another spoiler cast. I know we've had them sort of back to back here. But sometimes we all play the same game at the same time. And... Uh, Life just throws happened. you lemons in the form of Doki Doki Literature Club, and then you make lemonade <laughs> in the form of Edith Finch. Yeah, and then we record a couple spoiler casts. So uh, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. And thank you for watching the video. Bye.